Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. I want to hammer this a little bit. Verse 11. Also, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. God the Father decided that he had a wonderful plan. And he got together with the Son and the Spirit and said, I've got something that's so incredible, it's so cool, it's better than Call of Duty. Hmm. He had a counsel of his will. He had a decision of a purpose and a plan that he wanted to put into, an act, put into action. 1 Corinthians 3.9 Understand I'm not a big video game guy, but there are teenagers and some younger folks in the, uh, here that maybe will appreciate that comparison. First. Okay. Verse 9, we are God's fellow workers and you are God's field, God's building. Not only does God have a plan and purpose for this whole existence, the entire universe, in this one tiny little speck, probably somewhere around the side of it, not, not in the center, but this little speck called Earth, that he's got all of us on it. And he has a plan and purpose for this entire planet, for the people on it, for individual groups that he's calling out to do specific things, wonderful things. But that he has asked us to be fellow workers with him to carry out this plan. Again, I go back to the same thing. How can you be a fellow worker with God if you don't know God and know what his plan is? This is beyond a plan for your life. God has a plan for your life. This is, this is more important than you. This is about the glory of Jesus Christ, the maximum glorification, pleasure, and blessing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's more important than the few things that he has to do for you. But all of those things will add up for all the believers that choose to be obedient and choose to bear fruit so that Christ will be glorified. So what is the church? What are we here for? What are all of those people that have been saved from Pentecost, let's say, all those people that have believed from Pentecost to rapture? What is our purpose? And how are we distinguished from other groups? Turn to Romans chapter 11. Verse 1, I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be. For I too am an Israelite, a descendant of David, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people, whom he foreknew. And down to verse 25. For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. Just as it is written, the Deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. We are not Israel and we didn't take their promises away from them. Otherwise, God is a liar. Israel still has a plan and purpose. Israel still has a place in God's plan and a purpose to uh, live out. Uh, Again, to glorify Christ. So our purpose as the church, what are we? Well, the very word church is derived from um, ekklesia, the Greek word ekklesia. And it means called out ones. It does not mean a building where people meet. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 22. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. The called out ones that we are 
are called out to be a part of Christ, to be a part of his body, and we're also called his bride. And what is our function as we are here? We're called out, we're grouped together, we are um, headed up by Jesus Christ himself. What is our function as we are here? If we turn to chapter 4 right there, in verse 11, we can see some idea of uh, the operation of a church. He gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Understand that there are gifts, there are ministries, there are effects that are worked that are given to us by grace as a blessing in order to unify us, in order to bring us to maturity, in order for each one of us to take a part in edifying his own brother and sister in building up the body that he is part of. And no one uh, part is more important than another. 1 Corinthians 14.26 What is the outcome then, brethren? When you assemble, each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. Hmm. Each person has something to contribute. And so we see that each person is given one spiritual gift at the time of salvation, at least one spiritual gift, excuse me, at least one spiritual gift at the time of salvation. And that spiritual gift is not so he can be a big shot, even if he's a pastor. That spiritual gift isn't any more important than a server, than a helper, than a giver, than a mercy shower. All of these gifts were given to edify each other. To edify one another. So that we can be mature. The eye cannot say to the ear, I have no need of you. The head can't say to the feet, I have no need of you. We all need each other. The pastor teaches from the pulpit, equips you for the work of service. Each one of you edifies your brothers and sisters standing next to each other as you exhort, encourage, comfort, serve, give, whatever is necessary and whatever your particular giftedness is, you do that for your brothers and sisters. Otherwise, it's not working. And it's not working because we're being disobedient. Hmm. First Peter chapter 4, verse 10. As each one of us has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Understand there, what we're doing is being vessels for the manifold grace of God. And there's nothing special within us that we did not receive. So we should never act as though we didn't receive it, that there's something special about us. The only thing special about us is he who is in us and he that we are in. Ephesians 4. Verse uh, 7. But each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives. And he gave gifts to men. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. But each one, verse 7, each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. That is the whole point. The common good. 
Each one of us is for the common good of the one next to us who is also saved by grace through faith. You've now been given a very brief introduction to the ten um, areas that we will be studying. Those ten areas being bibliology, theology, anthropology, soteriology, philematology, agonology, bulology, ecclesiology, uh, charismatology, a bunch of other ologies. Just checking to see if you're listening. Those seem like very serious academic terms. And some of you, I know, will not be intimidated by those, but others may. Others may think, oh, we're going to get too deep in this. We better back off because it's too much for us. But there is no area of study that is specific to one particular gift. And there's no particular bit of information that only one giftedness or two giftedness, two different types of giftedness, is allowed to have. Each one of us is a believer priest in Jesus Christ. And each one of us is called to uh, rightly divide the word of truth, to be uh, studying the word of God to show themselves approved. All of these areas we are going to look at as we did tonight, just very briefly. But each time that we look at them, it will get a little deeper so that you will get a better understanding as you go instead of just being splashed with the, the whole of it. Uh, next week we will be picking up in the notebook, uh, going through uh, the snapshot of each one of these particular areas of study with a brief explanation. Following that, we will be studying bibliology, which I'm particularly excited about, and I think some others that I've spoken to are as well, because that study will allow us to answer that first question, that most important question that is asked, asked in this age, in this century, in this time that we live, and the one thing that is attacked above all else, when we say such and such the Word of God says, why do you believe that book? We've got to address that first. And there is a wonderful answer to that. And there is specific information that all of us should be equipped with to know and be able to answer, to apologize for the hope that is in us. To say, I'll tell you what, that is the most accurate and most uh, trustworthy historical document in all of history. Hmm. Let's end with a word of prayer. Father, your grace is always sufficient. Your grace is always magnificent. And Father, we're thankful to be studying the truth of your word, to be getting and gaining a solid foundation in your truth so that we can be fruitful in this Christian life that you have given us, so that we can walk in the works that you have designed for us, specifically designed us for Father, we, we thank you for edifying us with these, uh, these passages this evening. We thank you for opening them up to us. And we thank you for showing us that there is a purpose for everything. That there is a reason for everything that you have designed. And that you not only want, your, want yourself to be known, but want your plan and purpose to be known by all of us. Father, I pray that all of us, all of us would be obedient to study to show ourselves approved, to know that plan and purpose, to know the gifts, ministries, and effects that you would have for us, and how we can not only say, here I am, send me, but we can be prepared. We can be prepared. Father, I thank you for your grace and faithfulness, for, for your mercy and love. I thank you and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.